before we get started, um, I, I did have a question that I wanted to ask the audience. Can everybody read it? <laughs> Uh, for the record, uh, that is, in fact, my Mini Cooper, uh, and that is, in fact, my ass. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to uh, talk about uh, sort of a, a scattershot of stuff that is new in the world of online marketing. Hello. I found it was a little bit uh, light. Um, and we're going to start looking at some data from uh, Q1 uh, of 2012 um, that, that we've seen comparing year over year uh, on a number of different metrics. We're going to take a look at the impact of devices uh, on uh, search and how people interact with your brand. We're going to uh, uh, sort of talk about social media both as uh, a marketing channel in and of itself and uh, how it's impacting search. Talk a little about personalization um, and why it's more important than ever to uh, think about how we measure success. One of the things that we see uh, year over year, uh, it's starting out to be a very good year um, uh, for most of our clients. Uh, any of these kinds of benchmarking studies, uh, the results vary a little bit depending on the basket of clients that you choose. But what we are seeing is, you know, from a baseline of uh, 2011 Q1, uh, about 29-30% increase in spend uh, for most of our clients, uh, coming from a 32% increase in ad clicks and an actually a 2% decline in CPCs. A lot of folks on Wall Street uh, spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the CPC declines and its impact on uh, Google stock uh, and, and what that means. Um, I'm not sure it means much uh, because overall the monetization efforts are obviously going pretty well in their direction, uh, CPCs regardless. Um, what we're also seeing is revenue per click uh, for our clients uh, improved compared to last year uh, to the tune of something like 5%. Uh, and whether that's a function of uh, better monetization efforts on the part of clients, uh, improved website functionality, uh, or uh, uh, better targeting on our part, uh, hard to say. but. One of the interesting uh, trends that we see over the last year, and this is looking at the last six quarters, um, tremendous growth in click-through rate on Google Ads. Um, uh, and this is largely, and it's kind of flattened out uh, uh, from Q4 to, to uh, Q1, largely we think produced by changes on the uh, SERP that Google has made uh, the way that uh, they have integrated, uh, I will not say merged, but uh, integrated the sponsored listings with the organic listings uh, in a way that increases user engagement. Uh, and uh, uh, it has, has certainly had an impact on traffic. Um, in spite of their best efforts, the folks at Bing are having a hard time uh, keeping pace. Um, Google's share is not just large, it's increasing. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, again, um, a product of both click volume uh, and uh, to a, uh, a small degree, uh, uh, well, to a larger degree, it's query volume and it's click-through rate. So, um, Bing, we're seeing decline not just in uh, percentage terms, but in absolute value of clicks and spend. 
Um, the, interestingly though, the CPCs and the revenue per click are up. Uh, they're doing a better job of uh, matching, well, better is a strong word. <laughs> Bing has done a lot of work to make uh, results very targeted to the user query. Uh, so targeted that broad match hardly exists on, uh, on Bing these days. And uh, they are, to, to say that their broad match is better than Google's in that it, it matches user intent better uh, is probably not quite right. Um, they just don't match broadly very often. Uh, and so that has impacts on how many participants there are in the auction, which has impacts on uh, uh, how much traffic they uh, can generate. But it is higher quality traffic. One of the biggest changes in the, the search landscape uh, has been the addition of PLAs and their growth. Um, how many of you all are doing product listing ads in some way, shape, or form? Uh, how many of you have seen them grow to be incredibly material <laughs> of, uh, uh, of late? Yeah, what we have seen is uh, over the last six quarters, again, um, PLAs going from 1% of the business uh, of the Google paid ad business to being approaching 12% um, for a lot of our clients. So this is um, a huge innovation on their part. The graphic display uh, appeals to users apparently, um, and we're expecting to see Google doubling down on these efforts and more uh, graphic uh, elements appearing in search ads, uh, videos appearing in, in response to queries, uh, video ads, uh, in addition to uh, a, a better and smarter use of uh, display in general. On the organic front, again, just looking at some of our own data, uh, and to our consternation, uh, even since the beginning of this year, we're seeing an increase in not provided data on the organic side. Uh, over 20% of search queries now. What's interesting about that is the uh, number of queries, the number of unique queries is actually increasing uh, significantly over the last uh, uh, four months. We've seen uh, the number of unique non-brand keywords uh, increase for the clients we've studied almost 40%, even though not provided is eating a bunch of stuff. Uh, and, and this kind of runs counter to our intuitive uh, feel that Google is, is uh, quietly trying to strangle off the tail uh, and uh, you know Google Instant and all of these things trying to get uh, sort of more competition on fewer keywords uh, doesn't seem to be happening um, it, as we look at the data. So, interesting. I want to talk a little bit about devices um, and what we see as the challenges and opportunities they present. We're seeing, you know, obviously a growth in mobile traffic, uh, both organic and paid, uh, with, you know, almost 12% of traffic on the organic front coming in uh, from mobile devices. We know that as a class, the bounce rates tend to be higher uh, on phones, uh, but we need to think about these mobile devices uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, if you look at how the mobile performance breaks down, quite interesting. Um, we see that the red line there are smartphones 
uh, the green line are tablets, we can see that smartphone percent of traffic has actually kind of flattened out over the last year uh, at around 6% of the game. What's really driven the growth has been tablets. Uh, and the spread of tablets is uh, an important theme that impacts the way we should be thinking about search. Um, Google is the dominant player in, uh, uh, in traffic volume uh, on ads, from the ads. Um, the device really matters as we think about search uh, and paid search. If we look at tablets, one of the interesting bits of data that I've, I've unearthed is that something like 80% of tablet usage happens between 6 and 9 p.m. in the local time of the tablet. Pretty remarkable stat. 95% of tablet usage happens over Wi-Fi. And what this really tells us is that a tablet is sort of a mobile device, but it's not a walking down the street device. It is much more often a couch device. People are sitting on their couches looking at tablets while they're watching television, while they're uh, uh, doing other things. And that should impact how we think about tablet advertising. Um, particularly for brand advertisers, the array of uh, formats available to tablet users for running different kinds of ads, uh, tying ads uh, through games, uh, using what used to be the AdMob platform. Um, there are an array of different formats available that uh, people should be taking advantage of and tying to their offline uh, television. We know that as a class, tablets deliver higher quality traffic, not just than mobile phones, but than desktop. Um, uh, conversion rates tend to be higher. A average order sizes tend to be a little higher. And interestingly, we're seeing lower CPCs by position uh, than we see in desktops and laptops, which means uh, a lot of folks who are buying tablet ads aren't buying it very smartly. Um, you can get bar bargains uh, in tablet ad buying uh, because the market hasn't really caught up with the reality of how to segment uh, uh, advertising. Huge range of ad formats. Um, and one of the interesting uh, tidbits here is that the Kindle Fire seems to have lower conversion rates, uh, significantly lower uh, value per, per click than the iPads do. Um, and we speculate that iPads went to the early adopters, the more affluent folks. Uh, the, the Kindle Fire, the price points are uh, tending towards a more average demographic and pulling down the uh, uh, performance of those uh, ads accordingly. So, you know, we can't treat a tablet the same way we treat a phone. Uh, the ads are different. We need to segment them differently. Um, as we think about phones, you know, there's significant traffic coming over the phones. Something like, and I've heard different versions of this, but something like a third of traffic has local intent. People are trying to find something uh, that's nearby that they can get to. Um, and what that means is if, if your business is online only, uh, that one third is total garbage to you. Uh, we, we don't really want that traffic. The, the you know, codicil is obviously, from an e-commerce perspective, the conversion rates on phones are terrible. Uh, they have been terrible. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, people say, well, that's going to change as payment methods become easier. Eh, I'm not so sure. Um, apps make it difficult uh, to track performance. 
uh, of, of what's going on from mobile devices. We know that for folks with brick and mortar presence uh, in lots of different locations, um, certainly uh, mobile ads are driving people to your store. No question about it. People are trying to find your store. They're looking for uh, uh, something local to them that they can drive to. Uh, but we also know that uh, it drives people in stores to Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and that's somewhat less helpful. Uh, there, there are a number of folks who are uh, trying different ways to combat that. Uh, I know uh, there are folks who are uh, changing the uh, SKUs in the store uh, to be their own private <laughs> uh, uh, numbers, numbering system so that the Amazon barcode uh, thing doesn't work. Um, that, that's a technique. Uh, Big question with the, the, the mobile phone uh, deal is, you know, what should we be focused on? Should we be focused on how our normal website renders for different devices? Um, should we be thinking about an M.dot uh, uh, site separate and distinct from our standard website? Um, where, where do apps fit into this whole picture? You know, my take on this is apps are, uh, or at least they can be, powerful, powerful customer retention tools. Um, they're very difficult when it comes to attracting new customers um, because how do, you, how do they find your app in the first place? Um, that's, that's a real challenge of getting an app out there. Um, once it's there, if you have uh, enough repeat usage to keep people actively engaged with your app, fantastic. Uh, but again, one of the, the uh, data points out there suggests that something like uh, uh, the average app is used something like six times and then forgotten, uh, and that usage happens you know, within a, the first month of uh, people downloading it. People have so many apps uh, that they lose track of what they've downloaded. Um, MDOT seems to be a mixed bag. Uh, it creates issues, and I'll, I'll let our SEO folks uh, talk more about mobile SEO uh, implications of, of MDOT sites. But, uh, you know, do you want people to link to your MDOT site or your main domain, and are you splitting up link love between uh, properties that way? Um, I, it seems to me that Google believes uh, smart rendering is really the future, uh, that ultimately websites are going to figure out the right way to serve the right layout uh, depending on what device uh, people use. And the big, the big warning uh, rumbling uh, across uh, this world is uh, Jason Spiro, who is the, uh, uh, was the founder of AdMob, now runs uh, global uh, mobile for Google. Uh, says something like 60% of major brands do not have an acceptable mobile experience to offer users. And, and the rumble uh, in the background is, and Google is going to hammer them in the organic listings soon. Uh, it's already happened a little bit, but bottom line, if your site does not provide a good user experience uh, on mobile devices, your links are not going to show up. Uh, so, you know, a real shot across the bow for uh, uh, folks to make sure that uh, we put the right amount of love into our mobile. I want to talk a little bit about social media. Uh, anybody heard of this guy? Uh, <laughs> he's on an island somewhere right now. Um, in, enjoying 
uh, his, his recent IPO. Um, you know, we see traffic coming from uh, social sites to websites. Um, and looking at the referring domain, we see uh, obviously Facebook is still the big dog. Um, but we're talking about less than seven tenths of one percent of traffic to our clients' websites coming from Facebook as their, their previous uh, destination. Um, so it's not a gigantic driver of people from Facebook to your website. Um, what's interesting to me, I think, is Pinterest and the growth of Pinterest over the last uh, three quarters, now bigger than Twitter. That's amazing. Um, and I, I think we're going to see that trend continue uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, as, as marketers, we are uh, sort of forced to engage in uh, social media and build out uh, our own um, presence on Facebook, our own storefronts. Um, what happens on these storefronts turns out to be important. If people like your brand, that helps. Uh, it helps in search. Uh, it helps directly. Uh, social media engagement is important in and of itself. Uh, we see some very interesting uh, uh, interplay between email and Facebook. There's a huge overlap of people who come through Facebook and people who come through email. Sort of makes sense that the people who are your fans tend to be also be your customers. People who are your customers are on your email file. So a lot of uh, the conversations that you're having with folks on uh, Facebook are probably uh, folks who are also on your uh, email file. Um, Twitter, again, another thing that folks are uh, uh, having to manage these days is uh, a Twitter presence um, for both getting offers out, getting uh, folks engaged with the brand uh, and uh, uh, a little bit of uh, CRM as well. Google Plus, which I'll mention since Google is here. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, we know that Google Plus has a big impact right now on uh, the SERP on Google. So you need to pay attention. And uh, we know that you will be rewarded for having an active uh, brand presence. You know, if you're not really doing anything with your Google Plus uh, storefront, that's going to hurt you uh, in the SERP. You need to be active. Uh, that activity will be rewarded uh, in, uh, uh, in what results show up. Pinterest, I talked about a, a second ago. As you look at the way this social media platform was developed, boy, the consumer implications of it, uh, the, the advertising implications of it, the, the degree to which this platform could be monetized is really exciting to me. Uh, I see this as being, for anybody, particularly in the fashion uh, industry, uh, the, the potential for Pinterest to take over the world, I think, is large. It, it's fascinating on a number of levels, you know, uh, people seeing your stuff, people seeing that other people like your stuff, people commenting on your stuff, people clicking through and getting to your site. All of that is really cool. Um, and the, the possibility for social engagement uh, is, is really cool, too. So this person, Emily Smith, I don't know if you all can read this, but uh, seven of the eight uh, Lane Bryant uh, 
products that are shown were posted by somebody named Emily Smith. Boy, if you have the bandwidth, reaching out to Emily Smith with a coupon to encourage her to do more of that uh, could make a lot of sense um, because you've got a fantastic vehicle for advocates to advocate for you. If we look at the social implications on the search engine results page, um, and I am stealing this shamelessly from Danny Sullivan. Um, so if, there's a, if you see Danny's picture popping up and Danny's friends, uh, there's a reason for that. Um, but you know, if you do this new girl search on Google, uh, you get all kinds of interesting stuff from uh, their Google Plus uh, account. You get uh, notices that some of the people in your circle have plus one uh, that page. You get uh, the New Girl Facebook page shows up in the search. Uh, so, uh, so clearly, clearly, uh, the social signals are uh, impacting the way search is presented to users uh, in a way that I think is going to be helpful to brands in uh, pushing affiliates and others uh, squatting on your brand off the page. Uh, that more of your uh, uh, targeted stuff is going to be getting out there, which I think is going to be helpful. Bing just launched uh, their big social initiative uh, with the social sidebar, uh, which is a really fantastic uh, uh, innovation, I think. Um, they have tied in not just um, uh, Facebook, but Twitter also, uh, looking at the publicly available uh, uh, tweets and uh, Facebook updates. They've got the right rail is actually organized into three categories, which you can't see very well. At the very top, uh, there is here are friends of yours uh, who know something about New Girl, who have said something about New Girl. Um, so that's cool. You can reach out to that friend and say, hey, what do you think? Um, interesting interaction. Um, there is Below that, people who know. So people who supposedly have some sort of expertise. If you do a search for uh, movies, movie critics come up um, in there. And you can see what they're saying on Twitter about this particular show, movie, whatever. Uh, this is actually one of the actresses uh, showing up. Um, and if you hover over it, you can see, you know, uh, a, a bl blow up of um, uh, what they're saying. Uh, and then below that is just sort of general activity, and I'm not sure what the point of that is, frankly, uh, because it has nothing to do with what you just searched on. Uh, I expect to see that go away. Um, but interesting stuff. Um, you know, we know that uh, having pages liked, uh, particularly when images of your friend show up, uh, increases click-through rates uh, on those pages, which helps uh, organic uh, rankings, it helps search rankings, it leads to improved quality score and all of the good things associated with that. Um, so that's cool. Um, increased trust uh, because my friends like this, it must be good, it must be safe, they wouldn't have liked it otherwise, therefore hopefully uh, an argument's going to be made that conversion rates will uh, uh, be better. Um, there's an interesting question of the degree to which social signals uh, are Google's replacement to links uh, of, of uh, figuring out what's a relevant result? And I think the answer is no. It's an augmentation. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in data 
which Adam may speak more to uh, after a break, is uh, when you see folks get a big blast of tweets about something, the organic listing rises immediately, but then it drops again. Um, the social signals seem to be a recency game. Uh, and so if you have a question of, you know, with limited bandwidth, should I go after links or should I go after tweets, the links are going to be more sustainable long term. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go after the tweets also, but uh, it seems like that's the way these things are playing out. But I think, you know, if we think of the goal of search engines, um, it started out with you type in a query and the search engines try to figure out, okay, what do most people want when they type that in? And what are the results that the average person wants? And that's what you got. And that was the, the 10 blue links. I, I think, you know, we're moving to a place where we're not interested in what everyone wants. We're trying to figure out what your friends want. And that is going to be a better reflection of what you want. But the thing is, and I'm looking at these friends and, and, and hearing the little tiger uh, say to the chimp, you know, I really dig you, but you like bananas, and, and I'm just not that into it. Um, the problem is, you know, your friends don't necessarily like the same things you like. Um, and really, at the end of the day, what search engines are trying to do uh, you know, in answer to the question, are social signals going to take over the world? No, I don't think so. Um, I think they're one more signal in uh, an array of signals that's really aimed at getting what does this person want right now when they search for this thing? Um, and, and that personalization uh, is, is the real future. Um, is this the ultimate search engine? Talking into your phone, having conversations with your phone, uh, having your phone uh, find out things for you uh, in a conversational way. Is that the future? Maybe. Does anybody use, I heard somebody else at uh, uh, Search Insider Summit uh, ask the question, does anyone use Siri for anything other than it asking it embarrassing questions and seeing what it says? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, has anybody found it useful in finding anything other than that? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a great, interesting entertainment device. I'm not sure it's a very good search engine at this point. <laughs> um, uh, and I don't see it as being the replacement to search engines. Uh, again, I think the more uh, things diversify, uh, we're, we're not moving in one direction or another. We're just adding more stuff. I think all of this uh, added complexity that we've seen over the last year and that we're going to see going forward um, shines a very bright light on the importance of measuring success and how we think about what is success. If you think about the goal of advertising and not just paid search, not just display advertising, the goal of all of advertising is try to trying to figure out, you know, what's the cost that I'm paying to get what value? Um, I, I think Brand advertisers would argue that at the end of the day, they expect ROI uh, out of the brand ads. Um, so marrying the cost of traffic online to the value of traffic is really the game. Um, but getting at that value piece, the cost piece is fairly easy. Uh, getting at all of the value is harder. It's not just what happens on the confirmation page of your website. 
we know that all orders aren't created equally. Uh, the the $156 order on the right is more valuable than the $18 order on the left. Um, and for folks who are saying all orders are a check and we're driving to a cost per order target, getting to sales is better. We know that margin rates vary within categories, uh, that all $100 orders aren't equally valuable. Uh, you'd probably much rather sell $1,000 worth of accessories uh, than you would a $1,000 camera uh, based on uh, the margin rates uh, on those two products. Um, we really shouldn't be driving by sales dollars either uh, for those in the e-commerce space. We should be driving by margin. But what's happening after the conversion makes a difference too. Uh, we know that return rates vary. Uh, people don't return paint quite as often as they return shoes. Uh, and those in the shoe business know this in a, a keenly painful way. Uh, my wife buys three pairs of shoes every time she wants to buy one pair of shoes, uh, which I have to believe that uh, online shoes and Zappos and, and our friends at Birkenstock Central will stop serving her ads at some point. Uh, <laughs> I think they've got to be losing money on her. Um, and all customers are not equally valuable either. Um, uh, I hope that's not anybody's brother. Um, I did a search for dude online and uh, he came up. <laughs> um, but the dude on the left is probably not as valuable a customer to most of you as the Pentagon would be. The Pentagon is known to have fairly deep pockets uh, and to spend money somewhat recklessly, um, we really should be thinking not just about what happens in this transaction, but what are we gonna get for the, from this customer in the long run? And for clients that can feed us the information, we can bid to uh, drive more of the types of customers that tend to be high value customers rather than low value customers. Um, we can eat any data that you can provide us with uh, and fold that into our system. That's the beauty of having your own uh, uh, system. Um, we know that all leads aren't created equally either. Uh, for those in the lead gen space, tracking value is harder in a lot of ways than e-commerce. Um, the folks you know, at GEICO have probably figured out that leads coming from people searching for cheap car insurance aren't as valuable as those that come from people searching for car insurance and aren't as valuable as those coming from people who search for Lexus insurance. They all show up as conversions, uh, but they should not be treated the same way. We should be thinking about them differently. We should be bidding differently based on the value of those leads, which oftentimes we don't know until weeks, months later. Um, and we should be tying that loop back into whatever we're doing in online marketing. Online isn't the whole picture either. We know that the ads we place online drive offline behavior. They drive call center behavior. Um, we have clients uh, for whom the call center uh, represents 40% uh, 30, 40 percent of their paid search revenue comes from calls over the phone, uh, some more than that. And again, we have solutions to this uh, for clients to be able to track that offline spillover. Can we track into the stores too? Eh, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> if, if we can figure out a way to eat the data and marry it, uh, uh, to customer behaviors, either from you know, a coupon that they can redeem online or uh, uh, whatever, we can track that too. And finally, you know, as we think about the value of traffic, we should be thinking about also 
all of the interactions that led to that eventual value. And doing that smartly, rather than simply focusing on last touch, is increasingly important. With any smart marketing endeavor, there is a law of diminishing marginal returns. Uh, you, you buy the most effective advertising first, and you leave off uh, the least effective advertising. And if you have a little bit more money to spend, you'll spend more, but you're going to get a little bit less from that. And that's not a product of doing marketing badly. Uh, you're not getting diminishing returns because you don't know what you're doing. You're getting diminishing returns because you do know what you're doing. Uh, if you don't see diminishing marginal returns, it means you're buying ads randomly. <laughs> um, and that's a bad sign. Uh, uh, we should be seeing a diminishing marginal return, and we should be thinking about that diminishing marginal return as we look at our investments in online marketing. Averages can be deceiving, if we look at this particular uh, case where the advertiser is spending uh, $160,000 in a month, in a week, in a day, whatever the, the uh, uh, time period, uh, and they're getting uh, uh, a cost to margin ratio of under 100%. So they are making money. They're spending a lot, they're making money, that's great. And as they spend more money, as they choose to go from spending $30,000 a month to spending $90,000 a month to spending $160,000 a month, that average cost to margin ratio gets worse. Well, that's okay. Uh, uh, we expect that, and you're still making money. So everything's hunky-dory, right? But if we think about this in terms of incremental efficiency. Let's look at what we get for each of those $10,000 segments of spend. The story looks quite a bit different. We've gone from, uh, in going from $130,000 in spend to $140,000 in spend, we're talking about a 1,000% cost to margin ratio. We spend $10 to get $1 in margin. Ugh! <laughs> Same data. We're just looking at it differently uh, by increments rather than by averages. And if you look at this from the terms, in the terms of profit maximization, we see a curve that looks like this, that we would actually put the most money in the bank by spending something along the lines of $70,000 in a month rather than $160,000. That doesn't mean that's what you ought to do. Uh, the game of paid search or display isn't necessarily profit maximization. But we should at least be recognizing these trade-offs and thinking about them as we uh, think about how much we ought to be spending. Marginal analysis is, uh, is something that we do, we think, better than everybody else. I'm not sure that there are any other uh, search marketing platforms out there that are pulling in Google's bid simulator data to tell us what that trade-off looks like between uh, the costs uh, uh, of traffic and the amount of extra traffic we're going to get at different bid levels. Um, if you look at this um, graph, what you see is going from 75 cents to an 83%, 83 cent bid nets us, it looks to me, like 240 additional clicks. Everybody see that? Uh, you get 240 extra clicks for bidding eight cents more, and you get and you spend 240 extra dollars. So that's an interesting data point. We're spending a dollar per click for that incremental traffic. And you look at this and say, well, hang on now, I'm only bidding 85 cents. How could I be <laughs> uh, paying a dollar per click for that traffic? 
And the answer is, it's because you're paying more for all of the clicks, even the clicks that you were going to get anyway uh, at the lower bid. So we really ought to be thinking as we're doing our bidding, not just about those average efficiencies, but about the incremental efficiencies of what are we getting, uh, how much are we paying for those additional clicks uh, at the margins. And because we pull in Google Bid Simulator data, we can get a very clear picture of that uh, and take that into account. Um, Last subject for uh, my little spiel, what's new at RKG? Boy, what isn't? Um, we're growing. <laughs> uh, if you look at uh, the, the last eight years, more or less eight years, um, we've gone from being uh, two guys in a garage, uh, <laughs> which is what we were when some of you started with us, uh, uh, to being a company with more than 100 employees. Uh, we're uh, spending more than $120 million in, uh, or heading towards $120 million a year in paid search, um, which puts us up there. We're like top 10, top 12 globally in how much search spend uh, we have under management. That's uh, Mind-boggling. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, it, it's your money we're spending, so you know. <laughs> uh, we're gaining share on our competitors. Uh, the top ten globally thing is is kind of interesting because we, we saw the. <laughs> let me go back. <laughs> we saw, we saw that. Uh, and we've just sort of learned that uh, we, we matter uh, to, to the Googles and Bings of the world. Um, we saw recently AdAge released uh, by revenue what the 25 largest uh, search marketing agencies took in in revenue. And we didn't make that list. And as I think about that as a business leader, I think, wait, wait a minute. We, command, <laughs> we're in the top 10 in search spend, but we're not in the top 25 in company revenue. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> who's, who's running this ship? Um, I think those folks do a lot of different things. And no, I did not just say we're raising your rates. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but uh, I do think it's interesting. We know that we're gaining share uh, on our competition. Uh, we like that. We really intend to eat their lunch. Um, and a lot of our growth of late uh, has been a product of uh, uh, being a little bit more out there uh, in the marketplace and uh, asking people for their business. Um, we think we command a technology advantage that isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, and we intend to continue to advance uh, our paid search platform, our CSE and Facebook uh, platforms. Uh, we're, we're getting uh, uh, more and more experience in display advertising. And I think uh, our attribution system is absolutely amazing. And uh, we're really excited about where that's going. Um, we've expanded our services a great deal uh, because uh, we know that uh, we need to keep growing our service offerings uh, to be able to uh, serve the needs of our clients. We have an amazing partnership with Google, um, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, we have an amazing partnership with Bing also. We get to talk to their product teams in uh, early stage developments of products. Uh, we get to help uh, uh, give feedback and guidance to their teams on what advertisers are going to like. Uh, uh, and what's going to work. And that partnership is uh, really, really important to us. Um, and as much as I uh, uh, am willing to chide our friends at the engines uh, on the blog on occasion, uh, it should not be taken uh, as anything other than uh, deep respect and 
hopes that they will do even better. Um, for, for those of us who have been in this space for a long time, um, marketing keeps getting harder. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the early days, uh, online marketing was really about banner ads, email, and portal placements. Any of you all remember uh, negotiating with AOL for you know, gold or anchor tenant placement uh, in, in different shopping uh, uh, areas. Um, boy, were those the bad old days. <laughs> um, you know, it evolved from that to having to manage also affiliates, paid search, SEO, comparison shopping were sort of the next wave. Thankfully, a couple of things sort of went off of a lot of people's plates. Uh, a lot of people decided at that time banners suck. Uh, it was a pain to buy them. Uh, you had to go to each website individually. They lied to you about how many unique impressions that <laughs> they had. <laughs> you, you bought anyway because what else were you going to do? This was a new space. Um, the portal placements pretty much went away uh, at the same time, so that eased the burden, uh, but we kept adding things. Uh, we, we added conversion optimization to the mix uh, of things that marketing managers are often responsible for. Banners came back uh, in the form of display ads. We can't call them banners anymore. They're display ads. Uh, they're retargeting options, and it's really a brave and exciting new world in display because the Ad exchanges have changed the game fundamentally. Real-time bidding and the ability to buy at remnant rather than negotiating each deal one-off has changed the landscape in display advertising and made it much, much more cost-effective for more and more advertisers. Not everybody, but some. Retargeting, we're having really interesting success with. I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, we're not done adding things to your plate, though. Uh, <laughs> social media. Uh, not only are we responsible for uh, what's going on on our website now, but we've got all of these uh, other uh, places where people engage with our brands, uh, from Facebook to Google Plus to, uh, uh, to Twitter, and we have to be on track with that, and we have to be engaging with people. Um, we're having to do this across more devices uh, and come up with mobile designs for websites. And then we have to think about this marketing mix stuff. Um, and you know, the, the lesson in all of this, I think you know, everybody I talk to in the space is feeling incredibly, incredibly uh, stressed out about this. Because you know, the revenue is getting better for most folks, and that's good. Uh, but the number of things that you're responsible for managing <laughs> is growing a lot faster than the revenue, uh, which means it's hard to staff uh, and leads us to feel like this. Um, but this is where we're trying to help. We're doing more and more, uh, uh, providing more and more services to try to help clients um, when they are in this position of having more things to chase than they can chase. Um, as you know, we acquired uh, Audit Media uh, last summer. Uh, that was sort of the, the worst kept dating uh, to marriage <laughs> secret in the world. Uh, I think Adam's been speaking at our uh, uh, summits almost since the beginning, um, but finally happened. Um, really stunning uh, remark from the head of agency uh, services. Is Dave here? No, Dave didn't come. Uh, Dave said after that acquisition, man, that was a great acquisition on your part. People at Google think really highly of uh, audit media. And I thought, Holy mackerel, I didn't think Google acknowledged that SEO people existed. <laughs> Much less did they follow them and think about what they're uh, talking about. So, uh, you know, amazing team that we brought on board, working with some amazing folks. Uh, 
uh, in the space. Um, so gratified by that. You'll hear more from Adam. Um, I have a number of graphs, and, and for those of you who follow the blog religiously and know that I just sort of trashed the uh, value of case studies, um, we have a bunch of case studies. Uh, <laughs> Paul and Ryan are going to take me out back and shoot me after this, but um, but you know the reality is uh, we've got a lot of uh, examples of having taken CSE business from other folks and made incredible progress uh, over folks who supposedly specialize in this stuff. Um, more people saying nice things about us and, and the data to back it up. Um, we've had some amazing results in performance display. Um, again, uh, talk to your digital marketing lead uh, if you're interested in uh, display. If you don't know who your digital marketing lead is, they will introduce themselves at some point. Um, more display success. The, the all, all the things are going up and to the right. So that's, uh, that's the main takeaway. Um, we've had some real success in the social media space as well. Uh, this was a case of a, a large-scale e-commerce retailer um, using ads to uh, uh, promote a contest. Um, so you see, you know, big blast in impressions uh, of ads over a six-day period, that's cool. Um, but what's really cool, added a ton of fans. OK, do we know what fans are worth? Do we know if that matters? Uh, what we know is we created a lot of engagement that lasted a long time beyond uh, the promotion. So you, know, you hear a lot of folks say that Facebook ads don't work. Uh, and we would say that for e-commerce, certainly in a bubble of saying, are they driving a lot of revenue? Uh, yeah, the answer is probably no. Uh, but in terms of creating engagement, we can absolutely create engagement, which matters if and only if you've got a real social media program. Uh, if you're doing something interesting to engage with those fans that keep people engaged, that drives eventual business, uh, then absolutely uh, uh, driving that engagement matters. Um, thanks so much for your business. Thanks for being here. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Happy to uh, uh, pontificate on anything you want me to.